for almost any kind of model, no matter how simple or complex. I'm going to take a, a data set, which is uh, currency data, and apply this principle. So I have for various dates the currency rate against the US dollar of various currencies. So this says that on the 6th of November 2013, the Australian dollar was trading at 0.9497 USD. Now, this is the raw data level. Let's move this up one level of abstraction. What I'm looking at now is for each of these currencies, what the values are across time, which can be quite easily summarized by this simple curve, which shows me the Australian dollar over time, the Brazilian real over time. Now, the, while the curve itself is one level of abstraction, summary metrics like the mean, the growth, the variance, the range, these are other metrics that take me one level of abstraction higher. Now, this is useful. So, I can see that the Australian dollar is gently increasing. The Canadian dollar dipped and then increased. Uh, the uh, Indian rupee dipped and then, then increased. The um, uh, Philippine peso dipped and then increased. And then I say, wait a second, I said that three times. So maybe there's something in common between the Philippine peso and the Indian rupee and the Canadian dollar. They, send, they seem to be moving together. So now could I take this up one level of abstraction and say are these currencies related? Could I do a scatter plot for example when one is high is the other also high? So let's take it up to level 2 where I have here a plot between for example the Australian dollar and the Canadian dollar. And you find that yes, there is a mild positive correlation. Australian dollar versus Swiss franc. That's, there seems to be an even stronger correlation between these two. Australian dollar versus Chinese yuan. Even stronger, about 80% for those of you who can't read from the back. But you can see from the curve that. And Australian dollar versus the euro is even more strongly correlated. So we find that many of these currencies are positively correlated. But we don't necessarily know if that is true for every single currency. right? I mean, uh, maybe there is something, perhaps the Israeli kroner. OK, here you go. The Israeli kroner is marginally negatively correlated with the Australian dollar. So with this, what we are doing is moving from the realm of looking at one metric to pairs of metrics, specifically in comparison to the Australian dollar. But why stick to the Australian dollar? I should be able to take it up one more level further and say, let's take every pair and simply compute the correlation coefficient across these, which is what we have here. For every pair of currencies using the Excel data analysis tool pack, we just created it, the correlation matrix, which shows me that, for example, the FTSE is 100% correlated with the FTSE, of course, and 87% correlated with the S&P, 75% correlated with, sorry, I forget what IXIC is, but only 2% correlated with the Canadian dollar, negatively correlated with the Japanese yen, strongly negatively correlated with the Pakistani rupee, and mildly negatively correlated with gold, platinum, and silver. So I find also that if I look at it at this level, Pakistani rupee is interestingly negatively correlated with a large number of currencies. So are gold, silver, and platinum. And this led us to a publication uh, a few years ago, where we were looking at the pairwise correlations across a wide set of securities. So this 68 is the pairwise correlation between the Australian dollar and the euro, shown also as a scatter plot on the bottom left. What we then did was group together the securities that were most similar. So for example, there's a 98% correlation between the FTSE and the S&P. So let's bring them close together. There's a 92% correlation between, between the Swiss franc and Chinese yuan. So let's bring them close together. In other words, we were doing clustering on top of correlation. What that does is creates blocks of correlated securities. So go, uh, the Singapore dollar, Japanese yen, gold, Swiss franc, Chinese yuan, these five currencies, they tend to move very similarly. They're one block. Similarly, here's another block that moves together. The green indicates that they're positively correlated. Now, what happens, however, is that when anything in this block goes up, everything in this block falls. That's the red area in between, telling us that you have distinct chunks, clusters, of securities that tend to move together. And for a portfolio manager, it becomes very easy. For a portfolio manager, there are two kinds of decisions. When should I consolidate? When should I hedge? Consolidate means if I'm, let's say, holding stock in two oil companies, you tell the person, don't. It's practically the same stock. Consolidate and move all your wealth into just one of those. Second, if you hold oil, then you find a good hedge to it. Because if oil tanks, you need something that will hold your wealth up. So what is a good hedge? Typically gold, because when oil goes down, gold goes up. Now that is something that they can infer very trivially from this by saying, okay, so I'm, let's say I trade with Singapore and Japan. So I walk up and I, I, I find firstly that they are in the same block. So there's no point holding both. 
I will consolidate and just put all my money into let's say the Japanese yen. Now if I hold money in Japanese yen, if it tanks, what should I do? Well, go up and down, find the most negatively correlated one. It turns out to be the Sensex at the moment, the BSE Sensex. So park maybe a third or half of your portfolio on the Sensex and that makes your portfolio both uh, de-risked as well as consolidated. Now, this incidentally, when we shared this with one of their clients, they made their largest trade in the portfolio segment using this visual. Not because they weren't using correlations before. The problem was really about communication. <coughs> Models, even the simple ones, can be quite complex. And what I want you to take away from this is this. Increasingly, the models that are accurate are black box models. They were complex enough before. Now they are beyond hope in terms of understanding. Don't even try. And therefore they need interpretation even more so than ever before. Methods are emerging to, uh, to understand these. And a few powerful methods are simply visualizing these in terms of output and trying to interpret them. Build a visual summary that explains the model. Don't expect people to say, okay, because it's random forest, it has to be right. That's same as saying, because it's which magic, it will work. Build a model that will help them understand from their domain and help them interpret this in a way that they can relate to. Help them move up and down the ladder of abstraction. Start at a low level, build it up, summarize it. Then go one level lower and show an example. Build it up two levels. Allow them to change the parameters. Allow them to interact. Walk up and down the ladder of abstraction. And that's what really gives them the power to be able to do this.